All right. So we're here. Welcome to Ill Repute, the podcast where we support women's rights, but more importantly, we support women's wrongs. And uh, today we're doing part two of Calamity Jane, part of a series that uh, she's kind of one of my, what do we call it when you have the autizzy, when you have that, the spicy. Calamity Jane is one of my special interests. I love this. She is fascinating and I love <laughs> learning about her through your incredible research. My name is Sovereign Sire. I am a stand-up comedian, a screenwriter, a writer, an occasional journalist, a podcaster, and a former sex worker, and an amateur historian, I guess, at this point. Uh, and who are you? Who the fuck I'm, are you? <laughs> I'm Ella Darling. That's who the fuck I am. Um, I am a sex worker. I'm a virtual reality porn pioneer. I'm the world's first VR cam girl. I'm an amateur roboticist, and uh, I am so fucking pumped to learn more about Calamity Jane. Awesome. So last time we left off, we followed Calamity, uh, Martha Jane Canary. We followed her from birth in rural Missouri to crossing the Overland Trail to Virginia City, Montana. And then we documented the death of her mother, the death of her father, uh, and then she kind of becomes feral. And in between there, there is a seduction when she's 10 years old by a gold prospector who's very successful, kind of a millionaire type dude, but also a, a degenerate gambler. Uh, and what else am I missing? And then she becomes she, part uh, of what they call the rolling scum. So that was my favorite. Part. Yeah. So the rolling scum were people that would follow boom towns around providing all of the entertainment and gambling and ways for miners and soldiers to lose their money on payday. And so as the railroad was being built, little towns would sort of form around these railroads. And they were called boom towns because for several months or maybe even a year or two, they would be rife with people and there would be all kinds of entertainments going and it'd be in full swing. And then as soon as the railroad developed to the next place, everyone would leave and all that was left behind were a few stragglers. And they eventually, a lot of them became ghost towns. So if you've ever been to a ghost town, that's usually how they happened is when the railroad moved on, everybody left town. So... So she's rolling around. She's uh she's in the rolling scum. She's hanging out with prostitutes, soiled whores. doves, whores, gamblers. Hey, yes. Uh, have, would you say <clears throat> ill repute? We have a chain title. <laughs> yes, nailed it. <laughs> Um, I keep trying I to figure it. out a way to describe why it's ill repute because we have a plethora of women that we're covering and not all of them uh, were bad women. And I'm just going to go with like, we fucking liked the name. It's a good name. <laughs> it's a good and name. Because, yeah. Yeah. It's like they started calling us that and it was like, actually, that's pretty good marketing. Now yeah. Say it. It's got great mouthfeel. It rolls yeah. up the tongue. Also, can we make shirts? Rolling, Rolling scum. scum. Mm -hmm. So um, let us begin. And I, I've, I've really tried to work this script into something manageable because she's just really awesome. This section I've been really looking forward to because it involves original research that I did. And so there is some theoretical stuff going on here. So I'm just going to preface it with, I will let you know when I am basically going, here's my theory. Um, but here's the research I did that I think backs it up. So let us begin with part two. So, 1870 to 1874, the unknown years. Martha Jane Canary disappeared from the record from the ages of 14 to 18, and those years have been the subject of much conjecture, including my own. I did original research for this segment, and these are primarily my theories. While Jane did eventually write a memoir about three pages in length, most of its contents are provably false. Scholars have debated since her death what the true details of her life are. Using census records, firsthand accounts, and old newspaper clippings, most of her life and movements have been documented. However, there are still gaps. And where she was between 1870 and 1874 is one of those gaps. More precisely, 1873, but a little into 1874. So we'll start by reading Jane's own account of this time, and then we'll go into which aspects of her recounting are false. Uh, 
<clears throat> so she says, Mother died at Blackfoot, Montana, 1866, where we buried her. I left Montana in spring of 1866 for Utah, arriving at Salt Lake City during the summer. Remained in Utah until 1867, where my father died. Then went to Fort Bridger, Wyoming Territory, where we arrived May 1st, 1868. Then went to Piedmont, Wyoming with UP Railway. So this part is true. It's scant on details. And let me just say, given the life that she lived, <laughs> that her biography was three pages is a lesson in brevity and humility. Just breezing through epic shit. May we all have that concision. Is that a word? May we all may we all have that at some point in our lives. The airs this person put on in their life are slim to none. Yeah. So continuing. Joined General Custer as a scout at Fort Fort Russell, Wyoming in 1870 and started for Arizona for the Indian campaign. Up to this time, I had always worn the costume of my sex. When I joined Custer, I donned the uniform of a soldier. It was a bit awkward at first, but I soon got to be perfectly at home in men's clothes. Was in Arizona up to winter of 1871, and during that time I had a great many adventures with the Indians. For as a scout, I had a great many dangerous missions to perform, and while I was in many close places, always succeeded in getting away safely, for by this time I was considered the most reckless and daring rider, and one of the best shots in the Western country. I bet you were, honey bunny. Oh, she reminds me of me. I've, I've been I've been told on more than one Reddit thread that my ability to talk myself up is second to none. Yeah, but were you right in the thread? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, so like, okay. Okay, yeah. so here's the problem with this part of her story. It's that Custer was not at Fort Russell and didn't participate in any Arizona campaign. After that campaign, I returned to Fort Sanders, Wyoming, remained there until spring of 1872, when we were ordered out to the Muscle Shell or Nursey Percy Indian outbreak. Okay. So she means to say Muscle Shoals and Nez Perce, oh, okay. but she's saying Muscle Shell and Nursey Percy. Part of that is just slang. Okay. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that Jane was illiterate her entire life. She could not read or write, never learned to read or write. This was clearly um, ghostwritten. Most likely she dictated this to someone and then they wrote it down. When we were ordered out to the Muscle Shell or Nursey Percy Indian outbreak. In that war, Generals Custer, Miles, Terry, and Crook were all engaged. This campaign lasted until fall of 1873. It was during this campaign that I was christened Calamity Jane. It was on Goose Creek, Wyoming, where the town of Sheridan is now located. Captain Egan was in command of the post. We were ordered out to quell an uprising of the Indians and were out for several days, had numerous skirmishes during which six of the soldiers were killed and several severely wounded. When on returning to the post, we were ambushed about a mile and a half from our destination. When fired upon, Captain Egan was shot. I was riding in advance and on hearing the firing, turned in my saddle and saw the captain reeling in his saddle as though about to fall. I turned my horse and galloped back with all haste to his side and got there in time to catch him as he was falling. I lifted him up onto my horse in front of me and succeeded in getting him safely to the fort. Captain Egan, upon recovering, laughingly said, I name you Calamity Jane, the heroine of the plains. I've borne that name up to the present time. God, that is such a good story. Ruin it for me. I'm about to. So while there was a Captain Egan that was in command of the post... His widow later stated that he was never saved by Calamity Jane. This has caused scholars to completely dismiss this story. However, in doing my own research, I found that there was another Captain Egan at the same time that was in charge of commissary during the Lava Beds War that was badly injured during a conflict there during the same time frame. That Captain Egan eventually became a general and in his later years recounted the story of Calamity Jane saving him to a journalist named Josephine Brake. Now, the lava beds were directly west of where Jane was last living in Northern California. It's my belief that Jane traveled west where she mustered as a man and worked as a scout and saved this Captain Egan's life during the conflict there. I think she changed the details in her memoir so as to include as many big names as possible and to make it appear that she was more directly involved with what happened at the Battle of Little Bighorn. So let's talk about the Lava Beds War. The Lava Beds War, also known as the Modoc War, was a conflict that took place between the Modoc tribe and the United States military in the late 19th century. 
The war occurred prim- primarily in the lava beds region of Northern California and Southern Oregon. It was a relatively small but intense and protracted conflict that had significant implications for both Native American and U.S. relations. The Modoc tribe had historically inhabited the region around Tool Lake and the Lost River in what is now Northern California and Southern Oregon. As European American settlers encroached upon their traditional lands, tensions arose due to disputes over resources, territory, and cultural differences. In 1864, the U.S. government attempted to relocate the Modoc people from their ancestral lands to the Klamath Reservation, where they were to live alongside the Klamath tribe. However, the Modocs faced challenges adapting to the reservation and the Klamath people, leading to discontent and conflict. Side note, former co-host Susie Q. James is from the Modoc tribe. Her mother is a knowledge keeper for the Modoc. Oh, wow. Yeah. So frustrated by their conditions on the reservation, some Modoc families left the Klamath reservation and returned to their traditional homeland around Tool Lake and the lava beds. This decision set the stage for further confrontations with the U.S. government. Tensions between the Modoc people and the U.S. military escalated as both sides clashed over issues such as land rights, hunting grounds, and cultural misunderstandings. In 1872, hostilities culminated in the killing of a U.S. Army general during a peace negotiation triggering open warfare. The Modoc warriors retreated to the natural defensive position of the lava beds, a rugged and difficult terrain that provided a strategic advantage. For several months, the U.S. Army launched multiple unsuccessful efforts to dislodge the Modocs from their stronghold. The war came to an end in 1873 with the capture of Modoc leaders, Captain Jack and Boston Charlie. The captured Modoc leaders were put on trial and ultimately executed for their role in the conflict. The remaining Modoc people were forced onto different reservations. Captain Egan was badly injured during these conflicts, sustaining an injury that left him with a lifelong disability. This may, in fact, have been when Jane saved his life. When she was posed as a soldier, she often worked in commissary as well as engaging in sex work. What furthers this suspicion is that George Crook was in charge of the Department of the Columbia, which encompassed much of the Pacific Northwest, an appointment he received in 1867, and it was under Crook that Jane would later claim to serve. Further, Crook was in command during the Yavapai Wars in Arizona in the early 1870s, which does map onto Calamity's claims to being in Arizona during this time. If she mustered in the lava beds and then followed Crook down to Arizona during his next assignment. So the Yavapai, if you remember from our episode on Olive Oatman, inhabited areas of central and northern Arizona, practicing a traditional lifestyle that included hunting, gathering, and limited agriculture. As European-American settlers began to move into the Arizona territory in the mid-19th century, conflicts arose between the newcomers and the Yavapai people. The settlers' encroachment on Yavapai lands and resources, as well as conflicts over water rights, exacerbated tensions. The U.S. government established reservations in the Arizona Territory, including the Camp Verde Reservation, to confine the Yavapai people. However, poor conditions on the reservations, combined with cultural differences and a lack of sufficient resources, often led to discontent and resistance among the Yavapai. The first Yavapai War began with a series of skirmishes and conflicts between the Yavapai people and settlers in the region. The Yavapai resisted efforts to confine them to reservations and sought to maintain their traditional way of life. The war involved sporadic engagements and retaliatory actions by both sides. The second Yavapai War was sparked by conflicts over land, resources, and encroachments on Yavapai territory. The war involved several battles and military campaigns as U.S. forces attempted to suppress Yavapai resistance and establish control over the region. The Yavapai Wars resulted in the displacement of many Yavapai people from their ancestral lands and forced resettlement onto other reservations. The wars also marked a significant disruption to the Yavapai way of life and culture as they were pressured to assimilate into mainstream American society. George Crook was the commander of the Battle of Salt River, one of the most disturbing examples of settler violence, also known as the Battle of Skeleton Cave. It's such a cool name for something so fucked. Yeah. It occurred on December 28, 1872, between the U.S. Army and the Apache tribe led by Chief uh, Nantan Lupan. The Apache Wars were a series of conflicts between the U.S. military and various Apache tribes in the southwestern United States during the latter half of the 19th century. The conflicts arose due to tensions over land, resources, and the U.S. government's policies towards Native American tribes. Starting to notice a pattern here. Yeah. 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 Tale as old as time. Yeah. As usual. Chief Nantan Lupin, also known as Chief Eskaminzin, was a respected leader of a group of Apache warriors. He was known for his resistance against encroachments by European American settlers and the U.S. government. The U.S. military had been engaged in skirmishes with Apache warriors, including those led by Chief Nantan Lupin in the Arizona Territory. 
The Salt River Canyon area served as a stronghold for Apache groups providing natural defenses against military pursuit. In late December 1872, the U.S. Army, under the command of Colonel George Crook, encountered Chief Nanten Lupin's band of Apache warriors in the Salt River Canyon. The terrain was challenging with steep cliffs and rugged canyons. The U.S. Army advanced into the canyon in an attempt to engage the Apaches. The battle took place near a natural rock shelter known as Skeleton Cave. The Apache warriors had fortified themselves in the cave, using its defensible position to their advantage. Crook's force was composed of 130 troopers from the 5th Cavalry Regiment, led by Captain William H. Brown, and another 30 Apache scouts. The army took up a position around the mouth of Skeleton Cave and surprised the Yavapai band when they were dancing in celebration over a recent raid. Surrounding the cave, the soldiers opened fire. Some of Brown's men aimed for the roof of the cave as the Yavapai band refused to surrender. Others, who were personally accompanied by Crook, roiled, uh, rolled rocks and boulders down from the cliffs above. One warrior escaped the last volley by crawling on his belly. Realizing that he got out of the cave safely, he jumped on a large stone and let out a war cry while firing at the soldier's position. He was shot by a soldier from approximately 800 yards away, hitting the warrior in the chest and killing him. About 75 dead were found in the cave, including a number of women and children. No warriors survived the massacre. The women and children survivors were captured and taken to Camp Grant. Among the dead within the cave was Chief Nani Chaddy, who had said that no soldier would ever find his stronghold there. This stronghold was only known to the Yavapai and Tonto Apache. Apache scouts led the army to the stronghold, betraying their own people. Crook followed up this massacre with another at Turret Peak several weeks later, both considered victories by the government. The Apaches soon made peace at Camp Verde in 1873, though some skirmishing continued into 1875. After his victory, George Crook was appointed head of the Department of the Platte, which was headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska. Further evidence that Jane was following George Crook during these years is a wedding certificate that surfaced in the last few years showing Martha Jane Canary, age 17, had married a soldier named Thomas Rickard in Nebraska. I found that on Ancestry.com. That wasn't even any of the books I read. So just I'm just saying I did her whole Ancestry and I found so many records. If you're keeping track that she went 100 miles west okay. from where she was in Corinne. Mm -hmm and mustered there and was, say, working in commissary or scouting. The guy in charge of the lava beds and everything else, so Captain Egan was there in commissary, mm -hmm. but the guy in charge of everybody there was George Crook. Yes. Then Crook goes down to Arizona, wins some battles there, and gets appointed to be in charge of the Platte. So then he goes to Nebraska, where that is centered. And the same time, she ends up in Nebraska married to a soldier. So everything which, really tracks pretty pretty clearly. I, th I, think sh I think that she did save a Captain Egan's life. I just don't think it was the one people thought it was. Right. And I think that she said she was working under Custer because custer had died at custer's last stand and at the time that she wrote her biography and this goes back to what we we're talking about in jay-z night what we we're talking about with all of oatman that mm -hmm. memoir especially in these times like it had a job to do and so mm -hmm. there's a certain sort of party line that had to be followed and that is that manifest destiny is good mm -hmm. that native americans are bad uncivilized and that american patriotism and war presence and conquest that all of these things are good. And because she was a hoe mm -hmm. and she was selling herself, mm -hmm. she had to sell a certain narrative. Mm -hmm. And so to me, it makes sense that she would put herself under Custer instead of Crook because Custer was like the hero. Yeah. Um, that died at Little Bighorn, you know, trying to div whatever the, the, the narrative was being told at that time about his bravery. So everything read very much as like someone's like hoe story, you know, your hoe backstory that you make up because like I was not born Ella Darling, shocking no one, I'm sure. Yeah. But you sort of come up with sort of narrative. And sometimes it's just like sort of guiding like like for me, it's like, OK, Ella Darling is a little more gregarious and like I kind of invented some aspects. But sometimes you create a whole fucking 
personality backstory fan like sometimes people have this whole thing and it's it's part of what like it's it's what they're selling and it's part of what their their clients are buying and they know what their clients want to buy and i i mean hoes know what their clients want to buy yeah i have no doubt that she was no different yeah exactly i think she was an entrepreneur i think she was industrious and i think she knew what stories to tell to get the right reaction from audiences and to make a sale but her legacy is going to be complicated by this biography was very much reverse engineered from things that were already written about her. And we're going to kind of get into that. Just how would Jane have found her way into the military and found herself following George Crook? The road ranches. Road ranches, also known as stagecoach stations or wayside inns, were establishments that provided essential services to travelers, particularly during the era of the Wild West in the 19th century. These road ranches were strategically located along popular travel routes, often near stagecoach lines or well-traveled roads. They offered services such as food, lodging, stabling for horses, and sometimes even repairs for wagons or other vehicles. Travelers, including pioneers, prospectors, traders, and soldiers, would stop at road ranches to rest, replenish supplies, and take a break from their journeys. These establishments played a vital role in facilitating long-distance travel in regions where there were limited settlements and amenities available. They also provided a sense of safety and security in areas that were often remote and potentially dangerous due to the presence of outlaws, bandits, and natural hazards. Road ranches were a common sight during the expansion of the American frontier, helping to connect different parts of the country and enabling the movement of people and goods across vast and challenging landscapes. It was not uncommon to have sex workers as part of their offerings. These establishments catered to the needs of travelers, and in many cases, that included providing companionship and entertainment. And that is no different from today at truck stops across America. And I'm not being like labor across. This is this is really sincerely true. There's um, like there is a whole like it's a whole trade like working the truck stops. You you get regulars who are coming through on their routes back and forth. You get, you know, random people coming just straggling through randos in the night. And um, but it's a whole unique sort of subculture of sex work. And that's like immediately what I'm thinking of is like, that's yeah, what I thought of too. But also I thought like about you like casinos in Las Vegas where, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, it's known that working girls are there and, and they're allowed to be there in part because they're businessmen. Part the yeah. That's part of what people are looking for when they're there. Yeah. And they bring their clients and their clients have money. Yeah, exactly. With the railroad and the American Indian wars, there was a lot of traffic of soldiers and miners between Fort Russell and Fort Laramie. Along this route, several road ranches were built. Some were ornate, offering theaters and zoos, as well as restaurants and dance halls, and others were less so. Think of a truck stop today. Some are mega malls, and some are the sites of serial killings. Jane was working these ranches as a sex worker, but also getting work as a scout, a cook, a nurse, and a maid, as well as bullwhacking and freighting. In fact, it seems like she liked to hook long enough to get enough money to go out on scouting trips with prospectors or other settlers, and of course, to drink and party. As a side note, let's define some terms that will be used in the rest of the series because a lot of them are out of use or refer to practices that we don't use anymore. And and keep in mind, this she's like she's like seventeen, eighteen years old right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? She's like she's young. So she, bull, she's got the uh, handbag money. Yeah, exactly. But in her case, it would be like, she got that new boot money. <laughs> got a new boot and a new hat. New boot scooting. <laughs> so bullwhacking refers to a historical practice in the American West, particularly during the era of wagon trains and the expansion of settlement. Oxen, which are castrated male cattle, were often used as draft animals due to their strength and endurance. Teams of oxen were used to pull heavy wagons over long distances. Bullwhacking was primarily associated with the transportation of heavy and bulky goods, such as supplies for settlers, traders, and miners. Oxen were used to pull wagons loaded with provisions, tools, building materials, and other necessities. Oxen were favored over horses or mules for heavy hauling because of their strength and ability to withstand the rigors of long journeys. They were more resistant to diseases, required less maintenance, and were generally more reliable for hauling heavy loads across challenging terrain. Bullwhackers were individuals who specialized in driving and managing teams of oxen. They needed to have a good understanding of animal behavior, be skilled in handling the oxen, and have the ability to navigate various terrains and weather conditions. Bullwhacking was not an easy task. It involved physically demanding work, long hours, and exposure to the elements. 
The terrain of the American West could be rugged and challenging, and the journey could be slow and arduous. Bullwhackers played a crucial role in, in the westward expansion of the United States. They helped transport essential supplies to remote areas, facilitated trade, and contributed to the development of new settlements and communities. As the transportation infrastructure improved with the expansion of railroads and better roads, the use of bullwhacking gradually declined. Horses, mules, and later automobiles became more common for transportation, especially for shorter distances. So freighting in the Old West refers to the practice of transporting goods and supplies across long distances using various modes of transportation, such as wagons, mule trains, and later stagecoaches. It played a crucial role in supporting the expansion, development, and sustenance of settlements, mining camps, military outposts, and other communities in the Western United States during the 19th century. Freighting was essential for delivering goods and materials to areas where transportation infrastructure was limited or non-existent. Freighting routes crisscrossed the American West, connecting established towns, military forts, mining camps, and other settlements. Some routes were well-traveled and established, while others were more challenging and required navigating through rugged terrain. The journey often involved river crossings, exposure to the elements, weather conditions, hostile Native American encounters, and the risk of accidents. Freighters provided a vital service that supported industries such as mining, agriculture, and construction. They helped bring goods to areas where there was demand but limited local supply. Some freighters operated as independent contractors or entrepreneurs, while others worked for established freighting companies. These companies often had multiple teams of wagons or mules and managed the logistics of transportation. Freighting was a challenging and often adventurous occupation. It attracted individuals who were willing to endure hardships and face the unknown in exchange for potential financial rewards. The growth of railroads across the West during the late 19th century had a significant impact on freighting. Railroads provided faster and more efficient transportation, making some freighting routes obsolete. And lastly, we're going to explain what scouting is because it is different from regular military service and kind of explains how Jane might have gotten away with doing what she did in her lifetime. So scouts were often employed to explore and map uncharted territories. They would venture into unknown regions to gather information about geographic features, water sources, and potential routes for travel or settlement. They played a crucial role in military campaigns during conflicts with Native American tribes and other adversaries. They provided valuable intelligence about enemy movements, ambush points, and defensive strategies. Scouts were skilled at finding and creating trails through rugged and challenging terrain, I needed to like find a new word for that. <laughs> it was rugged and challenging terrain, y'all. It was uh, tough as fuck. It was, it was, yeah, it was hard. <laughs> it was a real bitch. Yeah. They could identify the best routes for wagons, livestock, and travelers to navigate. In the absence of modern communication methods, scouts were sometimes used to carry messages between settlements, military posts, and other locations. They acted as messengers to relay important information quickly. Native American scouts brought unique insights to scouting. They had an intimate knowledge of the land, flora, fauna, and weather patterns. They could also interpret signs left by other tribes or groups. Scouts often provided guiding services to travelers, traders, and surveyors. They helped individuals or groups navigate unfamiliar terrain safely and efficiently. Scouts were also skilled trackers, capable of reading footprints, animal tracks, and other signs to determine the movement and activities of people and animals. Several individuals gained fame as scouts in the Old West. Notable figures include Kit Carson, Buffalo Bill Cody, Jim Bridger, and many skilled Native American scouts from various tribes. This sounds like a ranger if you play D&D. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I got to maybe start playing D&D. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, we will. Scouts were not always soldiers in the traditional sense, but many of them were associated with military operations and campaigns. Many scouts were civilians who were hired or volunteered to provide their expertise. They could be frontiersmen, trappers, guides, or Native Americans with intimate knowledge of the land. Other scouts were soldiers who had additional training in scouting and reconnaissance. They were often enlisted or hired by the military to provide intelligence about enemy movements, terrain, and other critical information during military campaigns. The fuzzy relationship to the military would have allowed Jane to scout for the military without breaking rules around her gender and service. Because... She wouldn't be like enlisted. Right. So, so it doesn't count. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, and by all accounts, people knew she never lied. And like, well, there's some accounts that said that when she first did, she lied. And I think the name was like Charles Fish. <laughs> was like the <laughs> name she used. Um, but 
like everyone knew and they liked her. She was beloved. She was very mm. well loved and people wanted her on their missions because she was a great storyteller and she was really, really funny. And she had like a Shakespearean ability to cuss. Like that was the thing everyone said was that she was sort of the Russell Brand of cussing, you know, like just yeah. extemporaneously and voluminous and creative, you know, it was chef's kiss. I, you love a good, you love some good poetry like that. Yeah. I'm Pure poetry. Pure poetry. Yeah. Uh, I love her. So these years between 1868 and 1874 would have been when Jane started dressing in men's clothing, specifically as a soldier, so she could sneak along military expeditions and sell sex, because that was definitely something she was doing. Because if you go out with the boys and they're out in the middle of nowhere and you're the only pussy available, your pussy becomes you much more valuable. You have cornered the market. She was an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. Yes. Entrepreneur. <laughs> we love so, to see it. I'm so proud. Yeah, yeah. So she would hang around commissary and act as a nurse and seemingly go undetected by authorities for years while her fellow soldiers knew she was a woman and helped her pull off the deception. There is contemporary evidence that at this time, she also worked as a scout, a freighter, and a bullwhacker. Little did Crazy Jane realize she was about to become a huge star. 1875, the Black Hills Expedition. The Black Hills Expedition of 1875, also known as the Custer Expedition, was a U.S. military endeavor led by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. The purpose of the expedition was to explore and assess the Black Hills region in present-day South Dakota, with a particular focus on its potential for settlement, mining, and resources. The expedition played a significant role in escalating tensions between the Lakota Sioux and the U.S. government, ultimately leading to the events that culminated in the Battle of Little Bighorn in 1876. The Black Hills are a small mountain range that stands out prominently in the surrounding plains of the Great Plains region. The hills are composed of ancient granite and other rock formations, and their dark appearance from a distance gives them the name Black Hills. The region is known for its picturesque landscapes, including granite peaks, dense forests, meadows, and clear streams. Perhaps the most famous attraction in the Black Hills is Mount Rushmore National Memorial. It features massive sculptures of the faces of four U.S. presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt, carved into the granite cliffs. Today, Custer State Park is known for its wildlife, including herds of bison, elk, and other animals. Also located in the Black Hills, Jewel Cave is one of the longest known caves in the world, known for its intricate formations and passageways. The Black Hills region was considered sacred by various Plains Indian tribes, including the Lakota Sioux. It was a significant cultural and spiritual area for these tribes, and they had long-standing territorial claims to the region. Here is N. Scott Mamaday telling the creation story of Bear Lodge, or Devil's Tower, a sacred formation in the Black Hills. And then I've included a picture for you. That's, I love picture. That's Bear Lodge, a.k.a. Devil's Tower. Bear Lodge is what the indigenous people call it, and Devil's Tower is, of course, what the settlers called it. Oh, of course. Um, it's very beautiful, very striking natural formation. There is a story in Kiowa oral tradition about the formation of Devil's Tower, Wyoming, which the Kiowas called Tsoi, Rock Tree. Eight children were there at play, seven sisters and their brother. Suddenly, the boy was struck dumb. He trembled and began to run upon his hands and feet. His fingers became claws and his body was covered with fur. There was a bear where the boy had been. His sisters were terrified. They ran, and the bear after them. They came to the stump of a great tree, and the tree spoke to them. It bade them climb upon it, and as they did so, it began to rise into the air. The bear came to kill them, but they were just beyond its reach. It reared against the tree and scored the bark all around with its claws. The seven sisters were born into the sky, 
and they became the stars of the Big Dipper. That's really beautiful. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. If you get a chance to watch the documentary The West by Ken Burns, um, Mama Day is featured extensively in it. A really beautiful, really I mean, it's a Ken Burns documentary, so you know yeah. you know what you're getting. <laughs> My favorite feature of it was Mama Day's presence. He's also he's Pulitzer Prize winning Native American writer and an exceptional poet. For the Lakota Sioux and other Native American tribes, the Black Hills are considered a place of spiritual power and connection to the divine. The hills are believed to be a sacred space where the physical and spiritual worlds intersect. Many Native American tribes have creation stories that involve the Black Hills. These stories often recount how the hills were formed and how they played a role in the origin of their people. The hills are often seen as a place where their ancestors emerged or where important cultural events occurred. The Black Hills have been used for centuries as sites for ceremonies, rituals, vision quests, and other spiritual practices. Tribes would come to the hills to seek guidance, conduct ceremonies, and connect with the spiritual realm. The Black Hills are believed to be the final resting place of ancestors, and many Native American burial sites are located within the region. The hills are seen as a place where the spirits of the deceased can find peace and continue their journey. The sacredness of the Black Hills is intertwined with the historical injustices suffered by Native American tribes due to the seizure of the land by the U.S. government. The 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty recognized the Black Hills as part of the Great Sioux Reservation, but the subsequent gold rush and land conflicts led to the government's violation of the treaty. The Lakota Sioux have been engaged in a long-standing legal and cultural struggle to regain control over the Black Hills and to protect them from further development and exploitation. They consider the Black Hills to be stolen land and have sought its return. And, and it is. Right. <laughs> and they would be correct. <laughs> that is factual. Um, but before the Battle of Little Bighorn, where in 1875, George Crook was also in the area, lending more credence to Sovereign's theory that Jane was following Crook around the country as part of his outfit. It's 1875, and after Custer's expedition and the discovery of gold, the U.S. government uh, sent out another expedition, this time full of scientists to assess the overall resources in the Black Hills. Jane convinced a soldier that was part of the expedition to sneak her into the outfit. There's no hoax line I like more than a scientist. I know. <laughs> God. They're, yeah. So nerdy and generous. Mm -hmm. And actually kind of the most rebellious. Yeah. They're kind of, they're um, kind of the most burn it all down. Yeah. Yeah. So among those in the expedition was assistant surgeon J.R. Lane, who was also a correspondent for the Chicago Times. He sent a dispatch from the expedition that featured Jane, the first to write about her using the appellation Calamity Jane. And he said, quote, is it at all strange then that Calamity Jane should be here? Calam is dressed in a suit of soldier's blue and straddles a mule equal to any professional black snake swinger in the army. Calamity also jumps upon a trooper's horse and rides along the ranks and gives an officer a military salute with as much style as the first corporal in a crack company. Calam is often taken for a trumpeter or bugler, but Calamity isn't any such thing, for Calamity Jane, or rather Jane Canary, is a female. Another journalist on the expedition named Thomas McMillan wrote about her for the Chicago Inter-Ocean, which was kind of like a more liberalish paper, a little more left-wing. So this is from the Inter-Ocean. This Calamity, which high-latitude nomenclature has her, is a young woman who has followed the expedition from the first until now. Her costume, I must confess, is remarkably similar to that work by Uncle Sam's boys, and it does not appear to be the custom here for ladies to ride as they do further east. In this, I grant that I may be in error. It has been so long since we left civilization. Certain it is, however, that Calamity has the reputation of being a better horseback rider, mule and bullwhacker, and more unction coin of English, <laughs> and not he queens pure either, than any other man in the command. And it is even whispered that a certain Le Petit Corporal knows why Calamity came to the hills and how. So, so she, she cusses real. She's like, she's got a good cuss up her sleeve every but, day, all day. I mean, there's a there's a group of people who are like, Calamity Jane was just like a camp follower and like a whore and she was a cook and a nurse. And there is extant stuff that people are seeing her and she's attracting attention because she's good at this shit. It's not just that she's a woman following the camp. She's 
curses. She's well liked. She rides well. She bullwhacks. There's contemporary accounts of her and she's like 18 or 19. And she's on this like huge expedition and she's being written about in a paper. Like this gets back to Chicago. Like this blows people's minds. She can't read or write. Fuck, right. She, she doesn't know. She's just hanging out. Just hanging out, playing Nintendo, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'm just living the boss bitch lifestyle all day long. Can't help it. Yeah. Also among the party was, was A. Garen, a photographer that took the first known photograph of Calamity Jane. She's lounging on a rock dressed in men's clothes. After Jane's presence was discovered, she was sent back to Fort Laramie. But between the photograph and the dispatches from journalists, Calamity Jane was about to become an overnight celebrity. And this photo is so bitchin'. Her handkerchief is fresh to death, so white. Oh, man. Yeah. She's just lounging. Yeah. She looks so... I mean, and it makes sense. Everything about this, she sounds like she is living in her element. It sounds like there's no place she would rather be than... Yeah here doing this shit that she's like really fucking good at with people who like her you know like it's kind of living the dream the thing that struck me in studying her life and it was the center of her character is that she doesn't want anything more than what she's doing like she's fully actualized so 1876 with crook and i've included a picture here for you my love Mm -hmm. so that was george crook Kind of, he's got, he's, he's got a he's got a thing. He's got some swag. He's got some swagger. He's he's got some real facial hair going on, and um, there's a little mink I think maybe in his collar. A little a little a little fur. Yeah. Probably not mink. Probably he's something a, more. Local. He's a little fancy. Yeah, he's got some. He's got some style. He's got some style with these right there. Yeah. So in 1876, a military campaign began after government officials decided in November 1875, that the Sioux must relinquish the Black Hills region. Of course, they they must because there's gold there. Yeah. So it's unfortunate we just had to. Sorry, guys. Destiny was manifested right all over your land. Yeah. Sorry about that. A proclamation was issued demanding the Sioux come to the government's agencies by January 31st, 1876, or be declared hostile and forcibly removed from their hunting grounds. Many Sioux probably were unaware of the order. Winter conditions forbade others from traveling to the agencies, even if so inclined. Still others simply ignored the demand or did not understand its significance. Consequently, military forces on the Northern Plains received orders to take action. And in March, General George Crook, commanding 10 companies of cavalry and two companies of infantry, marched north from Fort Fetterman, Wyoming. That March, Jane, along with another sex worker named Shingle-Headed Frank, joined the party dressed as male soldiers. Frank ran a game of pharaoh, kind of like poker. And between the two, they drained the troops of all their money, then returned to Cheyenne, where they would spend it all at the road ranches before joining other parties headed back to Custer in the Black Hills. Jane would join teams as a freighter, then service the troops in Custer, then return to Cheyenne. That spring, she was arrested multiple times for drunken disorderly and for grand larceny for stealing a skirt and gown from a local normal lady civilian lady a respectable lady jane's into larceny drunken disorderly um her and killing it yeah her grand fucking time her and frankie have a whole scheme going joy go to the road ranches spend all the money get hot with a troop get him to sneak them in go back to the go back to where the fighting is gamble yeah fleece them with like gambling and sex then go back spend all the money in the road ranches just driving around in carriages and buying new clothes and getting really drunk and getting really disorderly. So you kind of get the idea of what kind of person Jane was. Like live she like was- live till you die. Just till the wheels fall off. There's no real there's no off button for her. It's just like she is like living it up. And we have to keep in mind she's this 20 inches very mentally appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Age. During this time she also witnessed the aftermath of the Mets massacre which she was so disturbed by, she talked about it for years afterward. Metz, a Custer baker, sold out as the Custer City boom collapsed and departed with his wife and uh, and a small party for Laramie. With him was a teamster named Simpson, a black cook named Rachel Briggs, and California Bill Felton with two companions, Gresham and Birgesir. Birgesir. The party was attacked at Red Canyon, Riding a mile ahead of the party. Trigger warning for the next paragraph for infant death, death, mutilation, violence. 
The next morning, a party found the mutilated victims strewn through the gulch. The woman was soon to become a mother. She had been cut open, and the unborn baby's body was tied around her neck. The men were also disfigured, and the cook, Rachel, had a stake driven through her body and was set upright against the branches of a tree. I wanted to include this because, just like in the previous episode, I wanted to include the story about Jack Slade is yeah. to paint a picture of what the stakes were when you mm-hmm. came out west. Right. The stakes were really fucking high. There was a lot of ritualized violence on both sides. Anyone that was out in the West was signing up for a very high stakes game of life or death at any moment. It was more unfortunate for the natives because, because they didn't they choose. Did choose it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so they get far much more sympathy and empathy because they did not choose it. It Plymouth Rock landed on them, so to speak. This was also a commonplace thing. Like this, w- this is what would happen because people were trying to send messages. Furthermore, they were consistently agreeing to treaties that were then consistently discarded. So every single time they think they're in a place where things are maybe going to work out with these white folk. Also, Native people are in a monolith and um, the things I've read and the podcasts I've listened to and the documentaries I've watched. It's important to note that within tribes and different tribes all had different strategies for how to deal with the white problem. Even within tribes or bands, there wasn't always agreement. And so people would go rogue. They would become frustrated with, we're tired of being patient. Like, this isn't the way, you know, so... Even even within one tribe or one band, there could be a lot of dissension about how this problem should be handled. And as the problem got worse and worse, the desire to rebel and to strike back was harder and harder to contain. And so that's why there was kind of this fever pitch of back and forth kind of massacring going on because of this this frustration and not there wasn't a unified agreement on how to deal with it. I mean, Obviously, people tried, you know, the chiefs were diplomats, but and, you know, had the interests of their people at heart. But that doesn't mean that everybody agreed. And that's right. how the dog soldiers came to be, which were younger native men that wanted to go rogue and didn't want to engage in diplomacy. And so they kind of splintered off and sort of formed their own group. So when Jane got out of jail for larceny, she went on a drinking spree until she heard that Crook was leading a military expedition out of Fort Laramie, 50 miles away. So Jane hired a horse, claiming she was going to take it to Fort Russell, which was just a few miles away. A week later, she shows up in Fort Laramie. She was pursued by the law, but they believed her when she claimed that she had just been so drunk she had missed Fort Russell and just gone a little too far. So the sheriff simply returned the horse to its owner in Cheyenne, and she was now at the base of military operations for General Crook. It's really convenient when your reputation precedes you like that. Yes. And I've included a picture for you here. So that is Jane at the age of 20. She's got a bitchin' hat, pool yeah. rifle. Yeah. I wish I could see those boots a little more. You'll notice in a lot of these photos, people look kind of fat, but it's a very cold climate. And most of these photos, people are layered up. They're wearing like three to four different garments because, you know, Montana, Wyoming, South Dakota gets cold. When you're looking at old photos of people from the old West, they were probably actually all about 20 pounds thinner than they look because there also wasn't that much sustenance out there. (laughs) Right. So the Battle of Rosebud, also known as the Battle of Rosebud Creek, occurred on June 17th, 1876, during the Montana War, a part of the Great Sioux War of 1876 to 1877. The battle took place in southeastern Montana between the U.S. Army and a coalition of Native American tribes, primarily the Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne. The battle was a precursor to the larger and more well-known Battle of Little Bighorn, which occurred just a week later. General Crook commanded the U.S. Army forces in the battle. Crook's forces consisted of cavalry and infantry units, as well as Native American scouts and allies from Crow and Shoshone tribes. 
The Native American forces were primarily composed of Lakota Sioux and Cheyenne warriors led by various leaders, including Crazy Horse and Two Moon. The coalition of tribes had come together to resist the encroachment of white settlers and the U.S. Army. The battle took place along the Rosebud Creek in Montana. The engagement was fierce and intense, with both sides employing vicious tactics and maneuvers. The Native American warriors effectively utilized cover and mobility to engage the U.S. Army forces. The battle ended inconclusively, with neither side achieving a clear victory. However, the Native American warriors managed to hold their ground and repel the U.S. Army's advances. The battle marked a significant setback for General Crook's campaign. The Battle of the Rosebud had a significant impact on the events that followed. It delayed General Crook's advance and played a role in his decision to join forces with General Alfred Terry's command, which included General George Custer's 7th Cavalry for the campaign against the Native American tribes in the Little Bighorn Valley. The battle provided a strategic advantage to the Native American warriors, allowing them time to regroup and strengthen their positions before the Battle of Little Bighorn. Jane claims to have worked as a courier for Crook, managing dispatches. While she's not mentioned in Crook's records or journalist's dispatches from the scene, she is mentioned by Captain Anson Mills, Lieutenant John Gregory, and most importantly, Frank Gruard. Frank deserves an aside because his name will be brought up later when there was an effort to earn Jane a pension from the U.S. government for her service during the American Indian Wars. Frank Benjamin Gruard was a scout and interpreter for General George Crook during the American Indian War of 1876. For the better part of a decade, he lived with the Sioux tribe before returning to society. He was General Crook's lead scout at the Battle of the Rosebud, participated in the Slim Buttes fight, Battle of Red Fork, uh, helped to assess the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Little Bighorn and participated in the Wounded Knee Massacre. And a stunning fellow he is. Mm, it's, goodness gracious, it's, those eyebrows. He's, he's beautiful. He's stunning. I mean, talk about historical hottie. My God. Yeah, I'm phenomenal. Gerard was a Eurasian born in the Tuamatu Archipelago in the South Pacific Ocean to a European father, Benjamin Franklin Gruard, an American missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and a Polynesian mother of Asian descent on the island of Ana in the South Pacific Ocean. He moved to Utah with his parents and two brothers in 1852, later moving to San Bernardino in California. After a year in California, Gruard's wife returned to the South Pacific with two of the children, leaving Benjamin with the middle son, Frank. In 1855, he was adopted into the family of Addison and Louisa Barnes Pratt, fellow missionaries for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Mormons, if you remember the Olive Oatman section, with his father. Gerard moved with the Pratt family to Beaver, Utah, from where he ran away at age 15, moving to Helena, Montana, and becoming an express writer and stage driver. It was during this time that Gerard became acquainted with Bill Bevins who was in Utah recovering from being stabbed and shot during a poker game. Bill Bevins, if you remember, is the man that supposedly seduced a 10-year-old Jane in Utah. In about 1869, while working as a mail carrier, Gerard was captured near the mouth of the Milk River in Montana by Crow Indians, who took all his possessions and abandoned him in a forest where he was found by Sioux Indians and later adopted as a brother by Chief Sitting Bull. Gerard married a Sioux woman and learned to speak the Sioux language fluently, taking the Indian names Sitting with Upraised Hands and Standing Bear, Yugata, as he had been captured wearing a bearskin coat. For seven to eight years, he lived in the camps of Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse until he managed to escape, becoming an emissary of the Indian Peace Commission at Red Cloud Agency in Nebraska. In 1876, Gerard became a chief Indian scout in the United States Army under General George Crook fighting Sioux Indians. By February 1876, many natives were leaving the reservations with some refusing to return when ordered to by the United States government. General Crook began his winter march from Fort Fetterman on March 1st, 1876, with many companies of troops and with Gruard as his chief Indian scout and interpreter. When Sitting Bull heard that Gruard was Crook's chief scout, he saw an opportunity to kill him in battle. By March 17, 1876, Gruard had located He Dogs and Old Bears combined village on Powder River in Montana. He followed the trail left by two hostiles who had been spotted the previous day all through the night, even when their tracks were covered during a snowstorm. General Crook, in his May 1876 report, wrote, quote, I would sooner lose a third of my command than Frank Gruard. 
Other scouts, jealous of Crook's preference for Gruard, tried to turn the general against him by claiming that Gruard had joined up as a scout in order to lead the army into a carefully orchestrated trap. But Crook saw through all of this. On occasions when scouting, Gruard would dress as a native so that genuine natives would take no notice of him. Thus, Gruard could pass as an American and as a Native American. He was a major participant in the Rosebud campaign and saw action in the Battle of the Rosebud. General George Crook and his officers, having retreated from the Rosebud, were hunting in the foothills of the Bighorns when Gruard, known to the Brule as one who catches and to the Hunk Papa as Standing Bear, was acting as guide. Between 9 and 10 in the morning of June 25th, 1876, Crook's forces were in Goose Creek Valley when Gruard saw the smoke from native signal fires in the distance, which indicated that George Armstrong Custer's command was engaged with the enemy, outnumbered, and being badly pressed. The officers present used their field glasses, but could make no sense of the smoke signals, and laughed at the idea that a half-Indian could have such knowledge of their meaning. To prove that he was right, at noon, Gruard mounted his horse and rode towards the signals, uh, reaching the Little Bighorn, a distance of some 70 miles at 11 p.m. on June 25th. Here, he discovered the bodies of the slain before being chased back to Goose Creek by hostiles, bringing the news of Custer's death to Crook. Gruard has been blamed by some as being instrumental in the subsequent death of Crazy Horse. In August 1877, officers at Camp Robinson received word that the Nez Perce of Chief Joseph had broken out of their reservations in Idaho and were fleeing north through Montana toward Canada. When asked by Lieutenant Clark to join the army against the Nez Perce, Crazy Horse and Minikonju leader touched the clouds, objected, saying that they had promised to remain at peace when they surrendered. According to one version of events, Crazy Horse finally agreed, saying that he would fight quote, till all the Nez Perce were killed, unquote. But his words were apparently misinterpreted, perhaps deliberately, by Gruard, who reported that Crazy Horse had said that he would, quote, go north and fight until not a white man is left, unquote. When he was challenged over his interpretation, Gruard left the council. Gruard claimed that he was present when Crazy Horse was killed. I have so many questions about him already. Like He's kind of a fucking Turk, a little bitch. Yeah. Like a little bit. Well, we did say he was hot, didn't we, Ella? Oh, my God. The circle hotties are always so problematic. Uh, the, the minute when you just look at someone's photo and it's a man, mm -hmm. I can look at a, any woman's photo and mm -hmm. be attracted to her and just want the best for her mm -hmm. and want to possess her like all at the same yes. time. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, if I look at a photo of a dude, especially an old timey dude that was taken on like tin type and shit. And my first visceral gut reaction is, oh my God, he's so fucking hot. He's going to turn out to be a horrible person. Absolute. Uh, the minute I saw his picture, I was like, oh, he's going to be a horrible person. What a guy. <laughs> his, own, his, his own wife's tribe. He's just like, no, please slam this idiot a little bit more. Well, men, men are not born to lead. Men are born to pursue at all costs. They don't have values beyond reckless pursuit. And if they do, it's because there's a woman around. Different. Oh, he was also like a, a total horrible like womanizer, abandoned his children, like married multiple, like uh, trash, like through and I through. Mean, I just wanted you to have a moment where you're like, oh my God, he's so hot and he sounds so cool. I just wanted you to have that moment, you know, yes. just... Where yeah, you could you dream for a minute. A yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah. I do. I know. Uh, you quench, you, you slake your thirst on my broken dreams. Yeah. <laughs> Th there's nothing the world, there's nothing I love more than the taste of really sweet dreams. <laughs> Gerard was also present at the Yellowstone expeditions at the Battle of Slim Buttes. He was assigned to the Pine Ridge uh, Indian Reservation during the Ghost Dance Uprising and was present in, uh, at the Wounded Knee Massacre of 1890. Gerard later served as a U.S. Marshal in Fort McKinney, Buffalo, Wyoming, and was involved in the Johnson County War of 1892. That someone like Gerard wrote of Jane being present for the Battle of the Rosebud lends a great deal of weight to her account of being present and part of the battle. It has been said, however that Jane never fired a gun at a person as rambunctious as she was. Uh, she wasn't a fighter. She likely worked as a teamster, a bullwhacker, a scout, a cook, a nurse, a mail carrier, and a sex worker, but never as an actual soldier. 
people like, oh, it's a complicated figure. She was part of the Indian Wars. And to that I say, I think she was as much as anybody else. Her parents brought her out west. She it wasn't that she like came out west to be a pioneer. This was this destiny was kind of thrust upon her and she was making the best of it. And she was later quoted by Flora Dufran as having said, and this is parlance of the time, um, was quote unquote I don't know much about white folks. I just spent most of my life rustling cattle and hanging out with the engines. Her lived experience was largely among Native people and not against. And she was part of the rolling scum. You know, she was she was part of the lowest class of person in society, even in Old West society. She wasn't thirsty to be a soldier. She just wanted adventure. It seemed very much that she wanted to be a scout. The people she looked up to were scouts, Bill Cody, Wild Bill. I mean, Wild Bill was very violent and killed a lot of people, but uh, Wild Bill was uh, a union fighter and came from a very uh, anti-racist family. Um, those are the people that she looked up to. Bill Cody was a lawman and uh, a showman and primarily a scout and a mail carrier. You know, like the people she was looking up to and wanting to run in circles with weren't, I don't think she was following General Crook because she wanted to be a soldier, thought he was really cool. I think she found a unit where she could kind of disappear and do what she wanted and they wouldn't really kick her out. And so she just stuck with that one, right? She figures out the situation, finds what works, and just goes with it. After Jane's presence was detected, she was relegated to commissary and then sent back to Fort Fetterman, where she took to drinking and carousing and eventually ended up drunk and naked, locked up in a guard tower. The town was desperate to get her out of their limits, and their prayers were answered when Wild Bill Hickok arrived at the fort on his way to Deadwood. She was about to embark on the adventure that would make her the most famous. So come back next week as we discuss the legend of Deadwood and Jane's ascent into dime novel stardom. Uh, I can't wait. <laughs> uh, yeah, so a thing that's going to come out is Jane had a very hard time keeping her clothes on. She was one of those... And I used to be this girl. I was known as the girl at the party that would convince everyone to take their clothes off. <laughs> and I didn't even know it. I would just get really drunk at parties. And then I would be like, let's get naked, guys. Let's do it. <laughs> and then one day a friend was like, oh, yeah. Like, if you're at the, if, if Sov's at the party, everyone's going to end up naked and in a hot tub and telling everyone else how it's perfectly okay. <laughs> but so Jane had a thing with uh, she would get drunk and then she would take off all her clothes and she would go tearing through the city like shooting out windows and and causing bar brawls and whatnot um oh the other thing i wanted to talk about is there is no no one's sure how calamity got her name we don't know if egan really gave her that name calamity jane was also slang for queen of spades which was supposedly a bad luck card to get in poker and then it's also said that she would gamble a lot and when she would lose a lot and she'd be like oh calamity like whenever she would lose a hand so, and then Calamity Jane was also slang for a prostitute. No one's been able to definitively pin down where she actually got that name. I think most likely she got it because she was a sex worker. Because everyone's names are like where you're from or like what you're known for. Wild Bill was called Wild Bill because it, his nose and his mouth, the way they were formed, it kind of looked like he had a duck bill. Oh. Which is why he grew out this like fancy mustache, mm -hmm. you know. So like, you have to kind of keep that in mind with like her name. It's like it may have very well just been kind of a coarse nickname for her, because for a lot of reasons people didn't like to go by their government names. The Rolling Scum. I mean, it seems it sounds like they all had really really cool nicknames. And it, you know, yeah, that's what we that's what we host. The too. school the school marm. <laughs> the school marm. Uh. That was her stripper name. <laughs> Um, thank you so much yeah. for, for we did it incredible insights we did it I am currently coming to you from uh, Tongva land here in Los Angeles 
And I wanted to do a land acknowledgement and just acknowledge that we are currently on Tongva lands and that they are still the stewards of the land. We are also stewards of the land. The, the land is, we are, everyone is a steward of the land. We all need to be protectors. Um, we should all be grateful uh, for our presence here and what we've been allowed to create here and uh, that we're allowed to create this podcast uh, because that we are on this land that was, sh that was uh, stewarded for centuries before we got here and kept beautiful. And I am speaking to you from Austin, Texas, uh, which is uh, the native territory of amongst many, the Tonkawa and Comanche tribes. Very nice. Very yes, yes, yes. And what you always say is part of the point of doing land acknowledgments is to acknowledge that you can learn some of their language that yeah. is still spoken because these communities still exist because they're not like mythic figures. They're fucking humans. You know, you can uh, you can actually learn Navajo on um, what's the language app that everyone uses? Duolingo. Duolingo. You can learn Navajo on Duolingo. 